My parents taught me the language of their homeland, and I switched between Cantonese at home and English at school until my first grade teacher wanted to put me in an ESL class for speaking English with an accent. I was seven. My parents didn't want me, or excuse me, on that day, my parents made the decision to stop speaking Cantonese to me. On that day, my language, my heritage, and my connection to them and to my past was slowly stripped away. My parents didn't want me to face bullying or discrimination. That happened anyway. They wanted me to have the best possible chance to be successful in America. This meant making me as American as possible, which meant speaking perfect English without an accent. So they contorted their own mouths into unfamiliar shapes spoke to me only in English and told me that I had to speak English better so that I would be treated better in this country. Whenever I tried speaking Cantonese in increasingly broken sentences with my parents, they would respond in English. Over the years, I lost my language. Good morning, I'm Lindsay T.H. Jackson, and welcome to today's episode of Keeping It Real, where we are talking about growing up Asian and what it means to be Asian in 2020s America. Joining us on the virtual couch is activist, mental health uh, counselor, and movement maker, author, blogger, and a dear friend, Ivy Kwong. Good morning, Ivy. Good morning, Lindsay. Hello. So I'm reading your words here. Tell me about, tell me about this, this piece. You go on to talk about uh, what it means to have to give up one's culture, one's history, in order to assimilate into white America. Can you share more about that? Sure, yeah. As the child of Chinese immigrants growing up in the Midwest, uh, Coco, Indiana. Um, I believe the Grand Dragon of the KKK lived there and they had rallies. So there were days when we did not play outside. Um, it was necessary to assimilate for survival. If you were going to be safe in this country, if you wanted to do anything you could to avoid discrimination, hate, bullying, um, you would try and blend in and, and stay safe. And uh, the thing is, you don't stay safe by abandoning who you are. You, at that point, let the outside world tell you who you are and inform you who you are. And that can be a really, uh, that can be really shaky ground to stand on, especially because as Asians, we, we have been historically painted to be whatever, um, whatever uh, predominantly white America wants us to be, right? So in the, in the 1800s, the Chinese railroad workers, where there were so many murdered uh, and paid one eighth of what white railroad workers were making to the 1960s, the era of McCarthyism, where if you were Asian, you could be thrown into, uh, thrown into jail and suspected being communist. Um, obviously the Japanese Americans were thrown in the concentration camps. And then the model minority brush that got painted over us um, in the 1960s. Uh, the term was invented by a white sociologist when uh, Blacks and Asians began coming together to, for political power. And the model minority, well, Asians should be the minority that all other minorities aspire to be because look at their values and all these other things. And so in doing that, there is a wedge driven between, between the races and the damage of the model minority and it continues to stay with, with uh, people clinging to that, that false safety, that if we are the model minority, then white people will be nice to us, will like us, won't hurt us. And that just isn't the case as evidenced by um, what's happening during times of this pandemic with COVID and so many of us being attacked, harassed, bullied. I, I was literally yesterday was told to go back to Asia yesterday so this is this is <laughs> this is happening, and at the end of the day, you know, to my fellow Asian Americans, we are not white. We will never be white, and we don't want to be white. Like it's, it's so important to know who you are, remember who you are, and stand as who you are, and not be told who you are by anybody else. 
Yeah. I mean, first of all, uh, having had my own experiences with that, can we just take a moment to let that settle in that what, whatever today is, July 6th, 7th, 8th, I don't know, days don't really count anymore. But, you know, in 2020, yesterday, while the rest of us were trying to go about our, you know, uh, lives, you were being told to go back to Asia. Uh, and what city did you grow up in again? Uh, Tokyo, Indiana, Rochester Hills, Michigan, Northampton, Massachusetts. <laughs> all the I mean, I born, lived. That is as apple pie America as there possibly could be. And, you know, still this um, way that we are using uh, our look of ethnicity in order to judge and in order to make these quick assumptions about individuals, that's one. But more importantly, that still a large swath of our country, men and women, know that the easiest, painful, hurtful thing they can say is something like this, right? How do you... Yeah. I mean, you and I have spoken about this before, but how do you, you're trying to go about your life, you're trying to be a mental health practitioner, you're trying to be an author, uh, a good person just because you are a good person, how do you then still find the desire to be nice, to be, to be helpful, right? When, when so many people are still projecting their hatred. So I am much more intentional about who I choose to be nice and helpful to. <laughs> At this point, uh, not everyone is worthy of my time, my energy, my attention, my life force. And so really carefully hearing, directing all of that towards those who want to and are willing to learn and to grow, right? It's interesting what you shared earlier also about the insult when it comes to uh, race-based hate. And the go back, go back to your country, the, um, the micro, the macro aggressions, you know, and the, and the same conversation, which was about a trauma uh, event uh, where there were predominantly white presenters on healing trauma. Um, and I mentioned, you know, it's, it's actually traumatic to learn about, for example, healing racial trauma from someone who is representing the ones who have inflicted the trauma. <laughs> so there is just so much there. And I was told by another white woman um, to stop complaining. And if you want your own, you know, conference and you start it with all Asians. I'm like, I didn't say I wanted one of all Asians. I just said I wanted to see more representation of any BIPOC community, like all BIPOC folks, like just experts teaching me about healing from trauma. That would actually land, you know, more deeply for me in so many ways. And so when you insult someone based on their race, there's this feeling of like, it, it, it's, it's always like an ouch, I'm not gonna lie. Like it, it always hurts. Like I don't care how many years I have lived in this life, there's still like a, it's a reminder that you will not belong to the majority, that you are not welcome, that you will always be seen as an other. Mm. And it's something you can't change, right? You look, I can't, you know, and I don't want to hide who I am and that will forever always be seen as, okay, you are not white, right? And so, um, the desire and the hope to enact change is something that I may not see the results of in this lifetime, but it's still worth doing the work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I said in our pre-show, this conversation, we really need a full day for, let's go ahead and pour the wine. Um, but. You know, one I want to talk about because you had a recent experience where you said this, I'm done. I'm done just being silent. I'm done being silenced. And I want to talk about that. But also, um, already we're starting to see um, with the work that both of us do in terms of supporting anti-racism work in uh, multiple fields and already I'm starting to see the fatigue of uh, well-meaning white allies 
as they start to return to the posting of what they ate last night, um, social distancing, ice cream cones, right? And you, you talk about in some of your writing about how we as BIPOC women, BIPOC men, BIPOC um, individuals across the board, we almost have to teach the resilience to continue talking about these things. Can you, can you uh, put it in your words? Because they're so beautiful. I feel like as women of color, we have been, we have been forced <laughs> to live as we are in the world from day one. There, we, it hasn't been a choice. We haven't had to, okay, I'm gonna choose to, to face all these obstacles and challenges in life and force it through them. Like, hello, because we are born the way we are born. We've had to live, breathe, and face so much discrimination, harassment, othering, literally our entire life. So this has fortified us to, we've had to be resilient. It hasn't been a choice. And mm. for so many of the white allies right now who are for the, maybe for the first time doing some of this work, it, it's, it's like, okay, I'm burning out. This is a lot. I, you know, it, it's, it's new, perhaps. This, this, level and this this consistency that is being called for and so there's a really beautiful um there are two images that i've heard of that that uh, i invite people to feel into um one is there is um i forget the term but it, when it comes to singing if there's a choir singing um one note if one person gets tired they'll stop and take a breath as all the others continue singing. And if someone else gets tired and takes a breath, the others will continue singing. And so there's also the same analogy when it comes in nature to birds. There are birds that fly in a formation of a V. And the ones who are coasting kind of behind others can rest on, on the air current caused by the wings of the bird in front of them. And then when the bird in the front gets tired, another bird comes up and takes that place. And then that bird gets tired and they fall back. And so in this work, there's an invitation to don't feel like you have to be the bird in the front the whole time because that is not sustainable. Don't feel like you have to be the voice carrying that one note the whole time because that's not possible to do that. So let yourself be buoyed by others. And, and that's why so much of this work and all of this work can only be done. Healing can only be done truly communally. Mm -hmm. We have to do this together. And so how can we create, sustain, and support each other and be supported in communities for this greater work, for this greater healing? for the greatest and highest good of all. Yeah, yeah. So recently, in one of the most badass moves <laughs> I've ever seen, you decided, that's it, I'm done. I am not being silent anymore. And you had made a comment in a Facebook thread calling out a sort of well-recognized trauma therapist and pointed out that her comment was potentially doing more harm to BIPOC children. Just a reminder for those who are hearing the term BIPOC uh, for the first time, that's Black Indigenous uh, Person of Color. So uh, it's an umbrella term representative of those different affinity groups. Um, and she came back immediately uh, threatening you uh, with legal action, et cetera, et cetera. But then you decided, no, I'm still not gonna be silenced. I'm going to write a Medium article all about it, detailing each of those experiences. What was that all about? <laughs> <laughs> um, so to, to share a bit more of what unfolded unexpectedly, um, there's a white female trauma therapist who's written books on trauma and how to heal trauma, how to work with survivors of narcissistic abuse, who posted days after George Floyd was murdered. Um, basically, I'll bet any kids who call 911 because one parent's beating up another are so glad to hear the cops pounding at their door. Just in light of everything. The, the, first of all, the tone deafness of it. And second of all, the fact that for many people who are suffering and struggling with DV, calling the cops doesn't necessarily make it better. There are so many cops who are abusers themselves. 
And if you are, for example, a black family calling for support in a family black area, those cops might not even show up at your door. And it might not be helpful for them to, it might cause further trauma. So I basically shared this publicly, you know, just a comment on the internet as one does. And then I was attacked in private messages where she basically wrote to me and was like, um, I hope karma gets you, you're just jealous. Also, this is harassment. And uh, she said, and I will never forget this quote. She said, I have the time and the resources to shut you up. Mm. And then um, her lawyer, her attorney, sent me a cease and desist letter. And I was like, wow, <laughs> okay, um, this is happening. Yes. And it, it was so violent, just all of the communication, everything that was going on. And so first I called my um, I have uh, two hours of free legal consultation through my insurance, the therapist, and the attorney basically, which I've never used in my almost 15 years of a therapist because I've never had anything like this happen, never had a lawsuit. Um, <laughs> and the attorney basically, I, so the attorney was basically like, uh, you are allowed to have an opinion on the internet. Mm. Like this is your first amendment freedom of speech. And I he said, if you, if you, if she, that people are allowed to have opinions on Twitter. So <laughs> <laughs> true. This is absolutely true. And so, and so I, he was basically like, look, if she wanted to make your life miserable, she could, she could file a lawsuit. And mm. so you have a choice. You can, you can choose to play it really safe and stay silent and let her shut you up. And if you speak, know that that's a risk. And so I have reached a point in my life, Lindsay, where I realized that you don't stay safe by being silent. It's yeah. not, safety is not guaranteed if you stay silent. And so I chose truth over safety, truth over comfort. And I decided to be really open about everything that happened, um, to name this individual and to share my experience factually. Like this is literally what happened, <laughs> like step by step by step. Um, because it would hurt too much and it would do me too much harm to silence myself and to stay quiet. There have been so many times when I've had to swallow my, my suffering, swallow my pain, swallow my objection, swallow my hurt. And that ultimately is poisoning me. It poisons you when you don't speak up yeah. and say what you are feeling, what you are needing to share and have spoken. And so, no more staying silent. That's, I just yeah. can't, I won't. And it's really interesting because, you know, you and I exchanged uh, some emails. I got to see, you know, the drafts of the article as you were working on it. And, you know, one of the things about internalized oppression is that it is a constant practice of trying to mire one's way through it. And even in our exchange back and forth, I was asking you, are you sure you want to do this? Are you certain that it was necessary to name her, to you know, show the, the feed and not just talk about the bigger thing? And so, you know, A, we're not monoliths, but even amongst friends, even amongst groups mm -hmm. that are, you know, oppressed, uh, we often forget to talk about how we're all at different stages of doing our work to take away that double consciousness, that fear of retribution. And, you know, I often call you my spiritual big sister. Um, and so once I saw it out there, I was so proud of it. I was so proud of you and realizing how much being silenced is a part of, um, sometimes the deal you make with the devil, especially as a professional woman trying to lead, like both of us are, large entities, um, that there's still that fear of, if I say too much, is it going to not uh, necessarily harm me, but harm all of the, the work that I'm doing, the legacy that I'm doing, when it's coming down to my truth versus another's truth. You know, the great thing in your article mm -hmm. is that every aspect mm -hmm. of it had been detailed on social mm. media. 
Yeah. You know, and the other thing is, um, I was telling somebody uh, about the comment in your reply to it, and they said, well, but maybe, you know, the woman was right. Like, they're, the police show up and, you know, maybe depending on the neighborhood, it might be different. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I live in a very nice neighborhood. I own my home with my two gap ad looking children. And yet there was an incident recently where there were six police cars fanned out on my street, lights off, couldn't see any of them. And presumably they were going after somebody with hopefully some probable cause to be going after them. But my immediate fear was, what if they think I'm who they're searching for? Because I am a black woman in a wealthy community, they don't know that this is my house. And so now I'm shoving my kids into the house and we're closing the curtains. You know what I mean? Like people tend to forget that that experience of being BIPOC in America is universal. It's not just in low income communities. Can you relate to that? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. There, there's always the awareness as you move through these spaces. I'm always like, are there, is there anyone else who is not white? When I go into the conferences I attend, when I go into the events I attend, when I go into the rooms and spaces I go into. And there's always a mindfulness of, am I safe here? Mm. And there is action that is taken, as you mentioned, and my heart, you know, just to have to protect yourself and your son, you know, in case they, they mistake you for whoever they might be looking for based on the color of your skin. And, and to live as you have, to live um, in that, to move I, through the world in that. I mean, oh, forgive me course. one second. I am mothering while working. And, um, yes, you I, are. One, <laughs> one, one second. Please do. <laughs> I also love that little um, that little play area in the background. I had I had one of those nice little. A little one bonk their nose, and uh, oh. they are okay. okay. The new reality. After heard it, care given. <laughs> Yes. Um, yes, that navigating safety in different ways at different times. And so one of the things in your work that you've really started to turn your attention to is your advocacy around making sure that within the mental health community, that that mm -hmm. is a space for uh, mm -hmm. Black, Indigenous, POC, LGBTQ, uh, IA plus mm. individuals, anybody that has normally been marginalized, making sure that there is mm. more attention to the ways that practitioners tend to bias their own practices. Mm -hmm. Can you can you talk mm -hmm. about that a bit? Sure. Yeah. There's this invitation to all who are who are doing this work, who are committed to this movement, who are committed to living their lives in this space to reach out and touch the spaces that you can. And as you mentioned, for me, that's the mental health space. Um, the world of mental health and traditional Western psychotherapy is based on the foundation of what was taught by, um, you know, wrinkly old white men. <laughs> and so that doesn't necessarily work for, for everyone who isn't. And so it's interesting because also, if you go back in the history, there's so much of this work that has been culturally appropriated. Um, from different cultures and from, so for example, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, are you familiar? Most people are like, okay, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You need to have food, water, shelter. And then at the very top, at the very pinnacle of this pyramid is self-actualization, which only a few people can reach because that is, you know, you have all these other things first. Um, most people don't know that Maslow went to stay and study uh, for a period of time in the 1930s with uh, the Blackfoot Nation, um, an indigenous tribe, and they have this belief system that is a TP, not a triangle. And the base of that TP is self-actualization, because there, if there, if there, there's a belief that is, if you are self-actualized, 
just recognizing who you are in the world and in alignment with your highest and greatest truth things will flow from there. And, and above the self-actualization is communal actualization. The recognition that together as a community, we, we are here to help and support and provide for each other so that no one goes hungry, no one goes um, without shelter because you are all here to support and to care for each other. And then at the pinnacle is something that is called the breath of life, which is sharing and practicing and passing on these traditions from one generation to the next breathing this life, breathing this memory, breathing this, this way of living and being and, and breathing to, to generations to come. And so it's interesting how Maslow took all of these concepts and was like, let me flip that upside down and add all these other things and have that. So, so EFT, you know, with, with tapping and therapy that is based on uh, traditional Chinese medicine, TCM, acupuncture, acupressure points. And this white man came along and was like, it'll be a great idea. I have this brilliant idea to like, you know, tap along these points. And so now this is what is taught. And this is what is practiced. And, and it's like so many times, so many of us are erased in the wellness world. Yes. And I mean, look at yoga, culture, you know, just to this, <laughs> look at Reiki, you know, which is root, it, it roots in Japan, it, it, ancient Japanese practice. It was not passed on through a practitioner, but everyone has access to that healing within you. And so it's interesting how so much of the white wellness world has made a multi-billion dollar industry mm. out of commodifying wellness and taking what is old ancestral traditional knowledge that's been around for thousands of years, putting it in a package, slapping it in there, marketing it a different way and being like, in the name of self-care, this individual, like, in the, what can you do to heal yourself? You know, taking it away from the communal and moving it to this individual. Um, it's just so interesting how this has come about and how this is. And so the work, so much of the work that I do is really supporting um, other therapists and my clients and those who are drawn to this, this knowledge and this work to, to decolonize your practice, decolonize your mind. Wow. Um, and to realize that everything that you've been taught is not necessarily all that is. Yes. Yes. You know, um, I was listening to, uh, Cornell West speak recently, and he described that decolonizing of one's mind, one's body, and one's spirit as a type of death. Mm -hmm. And we have to continually be dying every day in order to liberate mm -hmm. ourselves. Mm -hmm. Even for yourself, as you've been coming deeper into your awareness, into all of the ways that your cultural heritage was denied to you from such a young age, what has that death felt like to you? As you said, there have been multiple deaths along the way. So, so growing up, there was one death in the part of my family being like, you are not going to speak Chinese anymore because you don't, we don't want you to be discriminated against in this country. If you have an accent, you know, life will be harder for you. So we're going to take that away. And then my own rejection of my culture, of my heritage. Going up in the Midwest, I wanted to be white. I wanted so badly to be white, to be accepted, to, to have that sense of belonging that I never had growing up. I would bring my favorite snack to school, lychee, which is a delicious, you know, fruit, and have kids be like, ew, those are dog eyeballs. You eat dog, you're disgusting, you know, just from, from such a young age. You know, and children are taught this. This is taught, you know. So, so there's been so much grief in losing so much of who I was. And now there's this commitment to reclaiming all that. I'm taking Cantonese lessons, right? I, for the first time in my entire life, said I love you in Chinese and Cantonese to my parents. Just last week, after learning how to say, because they didn't say I love you growing up. <laughs> like, that was not in the culture. They didn't hug us, you know. Um, and so the first thing I told my Cantonese teacher, I want to learn is how to say, I love you. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway. And so um, I said it to my mother and she was like, ew, disgusting, gross. Yeah, we don't say oh, that. Mom. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> and I was like, do you say it to dad, mom? She's like, no, no, we don't say stuff like that. You just do things. You don't never, you never say it. But then I went to my father, who's actually the, the softer, more tender one, even he never shows it. And I tapped him on the shoulder. I was like, and I, and I said, I love you to him. 
And he didn't look at me. He was staring at his computer screen. He's always at the computer, you know, just, and, and he was looking at his screen and he goes, you used to speak. And that just moved me like to tears. Like I'm getting teary now, you know, you used to speak. You used to know, you used to remember. And I was like, I'm learning again, dad. I'm going to remember, I promise. And I want to have, you know, a conversation in my parents' mother tongue before, while I can, you know, in this lifetime. And for that, you know, I remember visiting my grandfather in Hong Kong and not being able to speak to him and just crying, like saying the few words I could. And so much of that history lost, so much of that connection lost, so much of that lost. And is, there's such deep grief there. And what do you do with that grief? And for me, there's a commitment to reclaiming all of who I am, especially with my language. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think um, in the Black community, we often uh, begin that reclaiming through our hair. Um, mm. After so many years of being told that uh, my hair is not good, that it's too nappy, it's too dry, uh, it's not straight enough, and all the ways from a very young age that we are trying to make our hair like white people's hair, that first moment when you just go and buzz it all off and then let it grow back out and allow its natural twist and turns and uh, tightness and expansion. And then for me, it was a very spiritual journey to lock my hair. It's not the same, but I can relate in that way. Mm. Deeply, yes, yes. Your natural hair reclaiming you and all yeah. of that. Yes. Mm. So beautiful. Um, we're having a couple of uh, technical difficulties. I, I'm going to ask you to turn your camera off and see if we might be able to. There you are. We got a video oh. now. <laughs> there we are. Um, you know, and it's so interesting when we're speaking about this beginning of reclaiming ourselves, because um, I've also been watching as you take that message of reclaiming oneself. And I shared on my Instagram feed yesterday, one of my favorite quotes of yours, which is, if you don't know who you are, people will try to tell you who you are. Mm -hmm. And you've been also applying this to your dating life, Miss, Miss <laughs> Ivy Kwong. <laughs> oh, we're going there. Okay, here we go. We're going there because <laughs> like I said, you are my spiritual big sister in all things. And so as a single mother, I'm also watching from the sidelines to see what dating is like. <laughs> Basically mm. like blah, vomiting because I'm so scared. Um, how does you. this reclaiming of oneself, you know, in your book, um, Healing from Codependency, which, hey, everybody, mm. I got to read an advanced copy. You can look for that coming out in October this year and it is brilliant and I've been going through some of the exercises. You know, you talk about this journey of beginning to reclaim oneself, beginning to uh, step into your worth, not coming at relationships from a place of lack or lack of worthiness. How have you both been giving by, you know, through your writing, but also working and applying it in your own daily life? Mm. So I will, I will rewind a little bit. Uh, the history of dating and the present day dating. Um, <laughs> so, um, I'll actually preface this by saying, just really quickly, um, there are five F's in response to trauma, which are ways um, we operate to try and survive. So most people are familiar with fight, flight, freeze um, as a trauma response. And then there's fawning and feigning, um, the two additional F's. 
So fawning is basically trying to do everything you can to please and appease the person in a position of power or the person who would like to like you. So doing everything you can to make them happy, liking what they like, doing what they want, very much people pleasing. And feigning is pretending to be less and to feel less of what you actually are. Again, for acceptance. So you want to intimidate the other person, upset the other person. So you pretend, oh, no, that didn't hurt. That's fine. Or, I, don't, I'm, I don't really need that, you know, or I'm not as powerful as I am. And so fawning, mm, right? Yes. Anyone else? Anyone else? Raise your hand if you can relate. If you're watching at home. Yeah. Whatever. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So in, in the world and in dating, you know, how you do one thing is how you do many things. In dating, there's very much being led by fawning and feigning. I want this person to like me. So how can I be what they want? How can I please them? How can I make them happy? How can I not rock the boat? How can I always be happy and okay and cool with everything? Even if like, I am not cool with that. And yeah. there's so many ways there was a censoring of myself, not showing myself and not allowing myself to be who I was in the relationship because I was afraid I would be too much. I can't be too much. I can't, I can't, I can't tell them how hurt I really am. I can't express that I have needs because what if they aren't met? What if they don't want to be met? And what if I lose that connection? So I chose to go out of line with myself, to abandon myself for the sake of connection. And I got the connection, but at the expense of myself. And so many times there was a bitterness, frustration, and resentment, even when I was in the relationship, because there was like a, you don't know who I am. Whose fault was that? My fault? My fault for not speaking up and showing up as I was? How could they know who I was if I didn't show it? And yes. I was, I was, there was too much fear. There was too much fear driving that. And so at one point there was like a reckoning of, okay, hold on. <laughs> um, Einstein, I think, said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing again and again and again, expecting different results. So repeat, repeat, repeat. In every single relationship I was in, it would be the same thing. Oh my gosh, you like, you know, playing water polo and watching the Patriots? I love playing water polo and watching the Patriots. I hate water polo and I don't care about the Patriots. Well, I was <laughs> in that relationship. The I did. There was the problem with that relationship right there. <laughs> what? <laughs> that was the issue. That was the problem. And, and so, but, the, but there was so much of a desire to be wanted that I would literally become a mirror of these people. I would chameleon mm-hmm. to fit in, to connect so that they would like me. And in the process, I lose myself. And so there, there came a point where I actually took a couple of years off of dating, sex, and relationships. Because I was like, if I can't be with myself, because also for survival, I felt like I had to be with someone to stay safe. I had to have someone want me, love me, choose me, so I wouldn't be alone. Because if you're alone, you die. Like, that's really how I felt. So it, there was so much compulsion towards, I need to find someone else. I get out of a relationship, immediately try to start getting to another without taking any time to breathe, to pause, to be with myself. And so in that time where I just full stop, I took myself out on date. I got to know me. I felt everything that I felt, even and especially the hard things, and welcomed them closer, embraced them, loved them, instead of trying to shove them away, push them away, avoid, minimize, distract, deny. There is a, re, there is a coming home to all these parts of myself. And mm-hmm. in reclaiming those parts, realizing that I can never go out of alignment with myself again. It will hurt too much, right? Like I said earlier, if you don't speak, if you... Don't speak up about what's true for you. It'll hurt you. And at this point, if I lie or pretend I am anyone other than who I am, that'll hurt too much. And I don't want that kind of connection, right? Like we found each other. So I'm like, this is who I am. You're like, oh, I can see you. I recognize you. And it's such an honor to be your special big sister because I'm like, I see and choose you too. But if I hadn't shown up as who I was, if you weren't showing up as who you are, we couldn't find each other. Mm. And so I realized for the first, I, I will be 40 in September. So I realized, you know, in recent years, that, hey, wait a second, if I want to be found, I have to be seen. Mm -hmm. And in the process, I will repel away a lot of people who are not interested, which is wonderful. If if any part of me is too much, then I don't want that in my life, right? Like I want someone who can be all of who they are as I am all of who I am. And this is for all relationships, romantic or otherwise. This is life, right? Like, I want you to be all of you. I want you to be all of you. And I want us to amplify each other and to, and to become more of all of who we are and can be and will be. 
in the process. And so that now informs my current dating situation. <laughs> and, and for the first time, truly, there is a, I'm showing up. Yeah. And I'm okay if you don't like it because great, you know, like I will love you and bless you and, and connect with those who can see me, who I will also want to see. Yeah, you know, let me just lay down on the couch here. I mean, <laughs> you know, because, um, you know, I move as I start to, uh, not only when I was reading in your book about the ways that codependency can show up and um, how much broader of a definition it actually is, because I guess I normally think of codependency more through the lens of um, that needing, um, me needing from somebody else. But what I wasn't realizing is how I can also play a part in codependency of being addicted to other people needing me and me going in to fix, mm -hmm. me going in to mm -hmm. save and then being so surprised when those uh, who I am saving, who I am fixing, who I am feigning, you know, no, 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 um, you know, you're in your recovery mode, so it's okay that you're doing this to me, that to me, this to me, you're in recovery, I'm going to help you through this, uh, when they later attack and bite, and then I'm left with this resentment of, but I just gave you the world, the house, the car, and the blah, blah, blah. And everything. And, you know, do you, what are the patterns? You know, um, that's why I'm laying down on the, the virtual counseling couch. Like mm -hmm. I, I think some of my patterns, mm -hmm. but what are the common ones that you see for individuals who are falling into these codependency mm -hmm. relationships? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So again, when it comes to codependency, I, it's a response to trauma, right? It's a desire to connect and to be connected with others as we all want and as we all need, but not knowing how to do that necessarily because we may not have had a history of it. And again, there's ancestral trauma that's passed down, intergenerational trauma, where if our parents were in survival mode and if you don't connect on a certain level, you're only able to learn connection on a certain level. And so when you say, I have a need to fix and be the one to fix and help, that survival, if you are useful, if you are not just chosen, but if you are needed, then they can't get rid of you. Mm. So in a way, that's guaranteeing your connection by if I can fix you, if I can help you, if I can save you, then you need me. And therefore, you have to keep me close. Mm. But then there's a compulsive, I have to keep trying to fix, to, to maintain it. And if one day you don't need me anymore, uh-oh, who am I? What is my role? Why are you still going to choose me? And there's so much anxiety and rise around that. So when it comes to codependency, there can be a lot of control. Like I need to control, I need to predict, I need to head everything the way it is. You need to do this. I need to make sure you do this. If you don't do this, I'm really frustrated you're not doing this. And I will do everything I can to manipulate to Joel so you do this because I know what's best for you more than you know what's best for you. Mm -hmm. So let me take care of that for you, right? And so there, there's a stance and, and so many people who um, are working through codependency are also attracted to narcissists. Mm. Like there is a, let me pour and let me give all of myself and it's never enough. But yet you feel compulsion to keep pouring, to keep giving, to keep trying to basically pouring water into it, trying to, trying to get water from a dry well. Like I'm trying to get love. I'm trying to get attention. I'm trying to get a con connection. I'm trying to get caring. I'm trying to get protection and you're not giving it to me, but maybe if I earn it, then you will. So what do I have to do to earn it? There's this idea that love has to be transactional and that I am not enough simply as I am. I am not enough simply because I breathe, which you are. There is a belief that I am not, so I have to continue to do, to be, to achieve, to accomplish, to be useful, helpful, perfect, pretty, smart, kind, successful, whatever it happens to be. And so really, I, I, beyond Kaboko and Hennessy, I think it's really like a human condition <laughs> you know, in so many ways, like, you know, let's just, let's just, let's just call it as like, as it doesn't do what, what is. Yeah. Like, I mean, definitely what we is. are from such a very young age and both of us teach this in our practices about 
how we are scanning around looking for how do we fit into the you know the tribe the village the community the family unit the workplace and so we start to adopt strategies and you know for myself i can think about in my little nuclear family i was the listener to adult mm -hmm. problems and from a very young age mm -hmm. i was trying to mm -hmm. figure out how to solve these problems and you know, you're four mm -hmm. and five, you're not supposed to be trying to figure out how to solve mm -hmm. problems for the adults around you. And so mm -hmm. um, seeing how one, uh, that's also been a great gift that I take into my work, but you know, mm -hmm. what I'm learning is that I don't have to take my work home with me all the time. Right. right? It's right. not just- And what a beautiful poem let me learn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> turning off the the tap of that type of emotional giving in one's own household or else what i'm gonna have to start doing is saying um you can you can come to the house with that sort of stuff but i'm still gonna charge you that, no i'm just kidding mm -hmm. <laughs> they're saying they're saying they're saying that at this point well since can you, you do that on i have date? so much compassion <laughs> Can you say, can do anything you want fyi a session i'm gonna have to bill you after dinner <laughs> Starting into coaching, there's a lot of emotional labor that's happening. So this will be itemized at the end of our at the end of our conversation. <laughs> well, just, I, I have actually so much love and compassion for your little precious four-year-old Lindsay self. You know, the one who is trying to fix the problems of the adults, the one who is trying, even at that age, to know that your livelihood, your your life depends on their being okay. So how can I make sure they're okay so they can keep me alive? And then how can I be just so much compassion for that younger you and for the, the younger us is in each of us, right? We all have all the versions of us who have been within us. We have our 5, 10, 15, 20 year old selves still within us. And yeah. so often we are driven by these younger versions of ourselves if they are not healed. Sometimes it's your six year old that shows up in a relationship, not your adult self. Mm. And it's, it's like, how can I get you? How can I make you okay? How can I save you? How can I make you stop drinking? How can I X, Y, Z? So you'll be able to see me, love me, and keep me safe. And there can be so much of an old familiar pain in that and dynamic in that, that um, can be healed. You know, everything that we are has been learned. So it can mm. be unlearned and relearned differently. So there's always hope. Yeah. Well, when you going through that <clears throat> because now I find as I try to uh, move around my path of development and really right now I'm focused on relationships in my life. Can you relate to this mm -hmm. feeling of as you're trying to be new, to be healed, that you can kind of feel like the Tin Man, like you don't know, you're so thinking and judging and questioning what you're saying and how you're responding that it feels mm. so unnatural while yours is that been your experience on dating at all <laughs> is that anything that happens um i so again as we die from these old parts of ourselves that are no longer serving us and as we are born into the new again and again and again each moment, that can be awkward. You can have baby deer legs. Like, what am so I doing? Awkward. Awkward. Like, it's what so is awkward. <laughs> Welcome the awkwardness. That's what's going to happen. Like, you're learning how to walk. Like, it's going to be awkward. It's going to be stiff. It's going to be strange. If you're used to doing, if you can do something you've always done, eyes closed, and you're not even thinking about it, that's, that's maybe not the way you want to keep going because that'll get you the same results. And so if you want different results, you're trying different things. You're learning to connect in different ways. You're learning to speak up and it might come out really blah, blah, blah. And I love the process of embracing the awkwardness. I love the, the speaking exactly, instead of like pretending that, yeah, that's cool. I've been, I've been this new way for years when it's like you literally start doing it like today, <laughs> right? And so how about we have compassion for ourselves as humans? How about we're like, so for example, if we're going to ask a, for a need to be met, right? Like, let's say we've never, let's say our whole lives, people have been like, what do you want to eat? And you're like, I don't care, whatever you want to eat. And let's say for the first time ever, someone's like, hey, do you, what do you want to eat? And you're like, okay, just for the record, this might come out really awkward because this is my first time ever saying this. And I don't know how it'll come out, but like tonight I, I, I secretly don't like cilantro because it tastes like 
So, so can we please have something that doesn't involve any cilantro, maybe Japanese food? And, and this might feel really scary, right? This might, and, and again, this can be anything. This can be having a relationship talk, right? For so many, there's like, oh, I'll just wait. Whatever they choose is what will be. I'll let them decide what the label is when they're ready. And I'll just hope that it might be more than what it is, you know, in the meantime, there might actually be, okay, this is going to be really awkward. And I'm just going to preface this by saying, you know, just, I, please give me grace as I'm trying to come out with this. Um, but what, what's going on right now? Like, where are you at? Can I get a finger in the pulse of what you're feeling in terms of a commitment, in terms of where you're at, ready for a relationship? Can we talk about it? You know, and that may be a conversation you've never had in your life mm -hmm. because you've always let someone else drive. And so you're allowed to be awkward. Embrace the awkwardness. Like, love the awkwardness. This is part of the journey. You are not born knowing how to sprint. You know, you're gonna be like, oh, I'm like crawling and then I'm like falling over. Let yourself make mistakes. Let yourself give yourself grace in yeah. this process oh. of doing things differently. And especially right now, because you've been writing on your blog, which, you know, this blog just keeps me, uh, I describe it to people as um, when Issa Rae's Insecure went off this season, I quickly picked up inner space travel and unexpected <laughs> quarantine dating story which was like i'm waiting for the hbo show that is going to come out of this <laughs> um because you're talking about not only this awkwardness of being new and uh embracing 40 and everything that's coming with that in dating but then mm -hmm. add covid into that mix mm -hmm. i mean mm -hmm. It's just too many things. Like, can the zombie apocalypse just come so we can get a break? Like, what has that been like? <laughs> Dating in the time of the pandemic. Uh, I know. How I is that? It's like so, in the time of cholera. Right. It's it's uh. So we're navigating completely new uncharted territory in new and uncharted ways. And so for me, I've been especially diligent about keeping myself safe. Um, for 117 days, I uh, quarantined and saw nobody outside my immediate family, which involved my parents and my sister and her family. Um, I, wear, I wear a mask, I uh, wipe things down, you know, like grocery wise. Like I, I have to stay really safe because I actually moved in with my parents at the beginning of the pandemic um to help support them um in a caretaking role uh, my father is 73 he's immunocompromised he has diabetes so there's absolutely no way i'm going to risk uh compromising his health his life truly yeah. um i i've been speaking with clients and with friends about how really covid is like the most intense sti because not only could it hurt or kill you it could hurt or kill those that you love yes. and so you really have to be like who have you been with and not just sexually, like who have you had a non mass conversation with lately? Like really, you have to do this now. Like just- Where do you get your groceries? Like you, <laughs> that's a great time to date. So, like, these, these are the conversations <laughs> that we are having in the times of quarantine pandemic dating. Like just, this is what needs to be happening right now. Um, if you care about those who you are spending time with, especially if they are immunocompromised or elderly, mm -hmm. right? Like you just can't be too safe. So for me, I was like, well, I'm going to be on a lot of FaceTime Zoom dates. Yeah. And then I gave up because I was like, this is too much. Like I just can't, right? And I, I thought I got off all the dating apps and I was like, there's much more important stuff to focus on. Um, very long story short, um, I am in a matchmaking database. And so <laughs> it's, it's a database um, and uh, a matchmaker randomly reached out to me and was like, hey, um, I think you'd be a great fit for one of my clients. And this is like totally, you have no idea what they look like. You have no idea like just what they do for a living. They give you very, very vague details. And she was like, and, and of course, in the time of COVID, we're going to do all the dates over Zoom. And I was like, sure, why not? You know, like, let's. <laughs> Let's do this. Uh, long, long story longer, apparently. Um, <laughs> I love it. Started, started Zoom dating um, an individual who uh, there's resonance with and just letting him know straight off the bat, I'm not going to meet you in person for a really, really, really long time because my father's immunocompromised. He's like, that's okay. Yeah. I, I'm enjoying the process of getting to know you. And so 
it's been a journey and how different to get to know someone, to have conversations about their essence, about what makes them who they are, about what their dreams are, what they believe, what they hope for, what they, just how they show up in the world, getting to know them without any sort of physical contact or any sort of physical intimacy or any sort of possibility of that. It's something that is, I think in so many ways, uh, a very, yeah, it's a beautiful blessing to have the chance to do that, to let yourself be, see, be seen and to see someone and to recognize like, hey, if this is not something that I'm interested in or like, wow, there's something more here. So little snippet, tiny snippet of many more stories. Of oh my goodness, yes. we'll just, I mean, I'm living yeah, like we only have so much time. <laughs> yeah, and I'm so happy you're doing it and I'm not, I'm going to keep dealing with nosebleeds, uh, apparently. Um, you know, we'll talk, I think, we'll talk. <laughs> I think there is just so much, um, complexity that we often leave out when we are storytelling and we often, you know, treat, we're treating individuals as though there's something that can be wrapped up in a paragraph on a book. And so I love that today in talking about uh, being Asian in 2020s America, we're going from being an activist to being an author to counseling Lindsay online. I hope you all enjoyed that at home. To, you know, going through our dating story because, you know, you are one individual, one Ivy Kwong with her uh, phenomenology, her collection of stories that have gotten you to this point. If there was one thought you wanted to leave us with today, something that we can take with us, tuck it behind our heart to remember, what would that be? That would be an invitation to be with what is arising in each moment. And what I mean by that is, uh, as COVID has taught and continues to teach all of us, um, so there's so little in life that we actually control. There are so many plans that have been made that we have had to dramatically change. And so there can be so much heartbreak, disappointment, frustration if we are trying to cling to expectations or even concrete plans. Um, and so the invitation to be with what rises in each moment is what is being asked to be now? What is my highest and greatest good now? What can I do, be, feel, allow now in this moment and in this moment and in this moment? Um, and to allow that to lead, to allow that navigation to guide you moving forward um, on macro and micro levels. Yes, yes, I will embrace that invitation myself. Mm -hmm. Spirit teacher Ivy, thank you so much for joining us today. Like I said, you'll be able to pick up Ivy's book in October healing from codependency and be sure to check out her amazing blog. You might see me on there at the same time, interspace travel and unexpected quarantine dating story. I know we all want to hear what's happening on the quarantine uh, dating journey she's on right now. So thank you for joining us for keeping it real this week. As Ivy's saying, keep it real even for yourself in here. I'll see you next week, darlings.